much. This is the example of Jomei Mutahir, right? <laughs> committed four days of conference and everyone is here. And of course, it's a testament to uh, Abu Islam on that's great work. Um, so uh, there's, of course, some overlap between what Rudy said and I, and, and I think in some ways we're reading things differently also. Um, so Professor Amanat has done it again. This time he's managed to sift through more than 500 years of Iranian history and present us with a lucid narrative that will be required reading for anyone interested in the history of modern Iran. He's clearly influenced by the French Annal School, and so when he covers Iran from the early Safavid through the contemporary period, he pays special attention not just to politics and diplomatic history, but to economic history, geography, material culture, and climate as long-term factors that affected Iranian history. And this often provides for very refreshing new insight into well-known and many unknown facts in Iranian history. He also continues the tradition of Anal school by paying close attention to the continuity of deep structures in Iranian history. In addition, after teaching Iran, the Middle East, and Europe for decades, he has the ability to make highly useful and broad comparisons between contemporary events and situations in Europe, India, the Ottoman Empire, Egypt, and Iran, and other major achievements, making this book of even greater interest to both Iran specialists and others in the field of history. For example, in the discussion of Safavid Iran, he shows that the Safavids did not emerge in geographical and political isolation, that they shared with the Ottoman Empire and the Mughal Empire, as well as with some imperial systems of Europe at the time, some rudiments of modernity. These included well-defined territorial boundaries, a sponsored and often enforced religious creed, armies that had great firepower, agrarian communities that were affected by the New World system of long-distance trade, overseas and trans-oceanic contact, and monetary trends. In the discussion of Safavid's forced conversion of the population to Shiism, Dr. Ramonav similarly draws parallels with other modern states, Spain and England, for example, where conversion to a state-sponsored creed, in this case Shiism, served as a social and moral mortar necessary to hold together the building blocks of a soon rejuvenated empire. In the course of a few centuries, this conversion led to the development of a modern Iranian, uh, Iranian Shi nationalism. And I think this is really one of the strengths of the book, the very gradual process of the emergence of Iranian nationalism. Amana chose the very gradual nature of this, from forced conversion of Shiism that could only be implemented in the territories that were geographically accessible to Shah Ismail. So this meant that Mesopotamia, Eastern Anatolia, southern parts of Central Asia could no longer, he says, be easily incorporated into Iran proper despite common Persianate culture, religious, and ethnic ties. Therefore, Shah Ismail's world-conquering project of enforcing <laughs> Shiism was bound to stop at the thresholds of Iran's natural front frontiers. Then we move to Nadir Shah's policy of drafting all male able-bodied men from remote villages his move away from the enforced Shiism of the Safavid era to move beyond the Sunni Shi sectarianism and his attempt to create what might be called a pan-Islamic identity, combined with his court's references to ancient Iranian history and Shah Nameh, all of which contribute to a form of proto-nationalism. The Zan dynasty in the second half of the 18th century and later the Qajar dynasty also contributed to this process by reviving images of ancient Iranian past and the coffeehouse culture where stories of the Shah Nameh were recited. We usually do not associate the Babi religion with the development of Iranian nationalism, but in the concise and highly informative description of the Babi movement in the book, Dr. Amanat shows how Babism has contributed to a modern sense of Iranian nationalism, uh, merging elements of Shiism with Iranianism. In Babism, we continue to have a cyclical view of history, as is common in the Shi tradition, but there's now a conscious strive to break away from Islam. There's also a new interpretation of resurrection, 
not in the old-fashioned way of whether it was a bodily or a spiritual resurrection, as the Shi clerics continued to argue, argued, but resurrection as a symbol of the end of an era and the beginning of another era. Babism, Dr. Amanat writes, emerged at a critical juncture when Iranian society had become conscious of its own national identity, more aware of external military and economic challenges, more critical of the shortcomings of its own state and religious institutions. Bob wrote some of his work, including Bayan in Persian, which, like Arabic, he considered the <laughs> sacred language. He adopted a novel solar calendar with 19 months. The start of the year was now Persian Nowruz, and would replace the lunar Islamic calendar. Another continuing pattern that Dr. Mate talked about is the inherent insecurity of the position of Grand Vizier, the high office in Iran, compared to that of the Ottoman model. We see this in the Safavid era, it's discussed in much greater detail in the Qajar era, most visibly in the tragic death of Amir Kabir, and of course continuing through the 20th century, the Shah al Mossadegh, for example. Many of these drop deep structures are then repeated in the Constitutional Revolution, even though Amonat agrees that the Constitutional Revolution was a true milestone in modern Iranian history. I'm going to say a few words about this since that is my area. Here again, as in earlier centuries, a progressive minister and champion of reforms, Amin al is forced out of the court because of his intrigue, uh, because of various intrigues, economic downturn, foreign interest, and colonial conservatism. Amonat's keen attention to economic policies undergirds many political, diplomatic, and religious aspects of Iranian modern history. He pays careful attention to major global economic issues of the time that preceded the Constitutional Revolution. The first major U.S. economic de depression, for example, of 1893, which left a serious impact on Iran's silver-based currency, and so Iran had to pay for the cancellation of the tobacco concession at this very time when the global depression had led to sharp devaluation of Iran's silver between the years 1892 and 1893. The government then farmed out all the remaining customs revenues to the Russians. Duties doubled under the Belgian administration of the border trade, who heavily favored the Russians. And all of this led to the ruination of many merchants, which of course becomes a precondition for the Constitutional Revolution. He also emphasizes again the crypto Bobby element in the revolution, how the ferocious persecution of religious reformers in the 19th century convinced the Azali Bobbies to conceal their religious views, leading them to express their socially progressive views in legal and constitutional language rather than religious ones or how the very idea of a house of justice, Beit al-Adl, was rooted in the Babi Baha'i religion. But Amanat does not limit himself to reminding us of the continued resurrection of these deep patterns in Iranian history. He points to the originality of the constitutional revolution as well, the fact that unlike the 1908 Young Turk Revolution or the anti-colonial movements of the Arab world, Iran's constitutional revolution was a grassroots movement marking a turning point in the history of modern Iran on the path to socio-political modernity. He follows this grassroots history as he tells the story of the constitutional revolution from the baths of 1905 to the formation of the first Majlis, 1906-08, to the civil war of Tabriz, 1908-1909, to the formation of the second Majlis, 1909-1911, the arrival of Morgan Schuster in 1911, and the public support he received, and finally the Russian machinations and British collaboration that ended the revolution in December of 1911. Now, if I have any regrets in reading this extremely impressive work, is that I wish more of a gendered view of politics was incorporated into this work. You're surprised that I'm saying that. <coughs> By which I don't want you to think uh, that there has to be more discussion of women, because he actually does quite a good job of that, as prominent men, women, such as Mahdul Yaw or Ghurratul Ain, are certainly discussed. I mean, looking at how enduring gender patterns in Shi Iranian culture have also affected and shaped macro politics of Iran. So, for example, in the discussion of the highly violent and disruptive insecurities of the harem administra of the royal administration, from the Safavid through the Qajar, a discussion of Iran's tradition of polygamy would have shed greater light. 
in accord with four former wives and numerous temporary wives, intrigue, backstabbing, murder, and a high degree of violence were natural occurrences when only one son could become king, and he would often order the execution of all his brothers and other contenders for power soon after coming to power. The Catholic Church in medieval and early modern Europe dealt with this issue by enforcing formal monogamy and recognizing only the crown prince that was born of the wife's marriage, uh, and that is of the king's marriage to the country's queen, and not recognizing the king's many other children born of his concubines. This was a great stabilizing factor for both the church and for many European monarchies, and also explains the great patronage that many queens showed to the church. And if you want to see an example of that, watch the series Versailles on Netflix. <laughs> Another way of dealing with this problem was the solution adopted by the Ottomans. In this case, there were four wives who could potentially produce heirs. The harem administration adopted the policy of one mother, one son, when wives who did, not give, who did give birth to sons were now denied further access to the king, thereby sh reducing the number of sons born to the same mother and therefore reducing the number of contenders to power. In the Iranian Shi'i court, no efforts were made to systematically reduce the number of contenders. All children born, born of temporary or formal marriages, including recognized children of Kenizes, were theoretically eligible for inheritance and potential contenders for power, making murder of one's competitor the only available solution to the contenders for power. Another example has to do with the book's argument that there were, quote, serious little articulation of political thought, democratic rule versus despotism, civil and human rights versus power of the state, legislated law versus the primacy of divine law, and secular values of the emerging society versus requirements of the Sharia in the Constitutional Revolution, as Dr. Amanat says. But at the turn of the 20th century, any serious discussion of the above issues, whether democracy, civil rights, Sharia versus constitutional law, immediately led to the question of women's place in society, her access to public spaces, rights of religious minorities of Iran, and other marginal people, such as slaves, the question thus immediately became who was entitled to these democratic rights? What was to be done with existing Sharia law that existed the subservience of both women and religious <coughs> women to men and religious minorities to Muslim? And what was to be done with non-recognized religious minorities such as the Babis? There was also the fact that the balance of power had shifted dramatically by the early 20th century. Christian nations had become powerful colonial forces, were sending emissaries and merchants to Iran on a regular basis, and were urging the Iranian state to grant protection to non-Muslims and recognize the rights uh, of these non-Muslims, both the ones who were coming in and the ones of Iran, a process that had taken place in the Ottoman Empire a century earlier. On the other hand, the Usuli Mujtahids were still adamantly opposed to the granting of these rights more than half a century after the brutalities that Amonat so vividly describes uh, incited against the Babis and later the Baha'is, they still refused to budge. After all, what did Sheikh Fazl al say in the Constitutional Revolution? He complained that the idiotic constitutionalists were saying that a Muslim and non-Muslim should have the same rights, and that in a future constitutional world, he warned women would wear pants and marry, marry non-Muslims, both of which were outrageous to him, but at the same time were correct assumptions about democracy. Muhammad Hussein in Oini's Tanbihul Umma wa Tanzihul Millat, Awakening of the Muslim Community and Purifying of the Nation, is often singled out as the one Shi intellectual who seriously grappled with the project of reconciling constitutionalism with the Sharia, and Dr. Amanat talks about him as well. But I believe he not only fell far short, but that there were better examples. He did support the election of recognized religious minorities to the Majlis, saying that, and this is good by, by Naini, if the minorities select someone from their rank, even though they are not expected to be loyal to Islam, they will exhibit good will toward the nation, Vatan, and others, and such qualifications will be sufficient for their participation. So that, that was a big advance for the time. 
But he also contributed to the idea of Article 2 to the Supplementary Constitutional Law, which created a committee of clerics that monitored and then could veto the deliberations of the majlis. In his Tambihul Umma, he assuaged his audience's concerns that the new laws might end up legitimizing, quote, the equality of Muslims with Zemmi non-Muslims, or leading, quote, to the unveiling of women. He assured them that no such thing was ha going to happen. No such radical measures would ever be adopted in Iran because the Constitution did not, he specified, call for equality between adults and children, sane and insane persons, healthy and sick people, and so forth. With these assurances, he convinced many other clerics that the new constitutional order with the supplementary laws would not threaten the ulama's authority in any significant way. I believe the person who truly developed a new political theory for this period was Ali Akbar de Khuda. However, since his writings appeared as editorial columns rather than in a book manuscript, his views were never discussed in any great detail. In his editorials to Suresh Rafi, and I'm not talking about his Charan Paran, humorous columns, but his editorials, he undermined the three central pillars of Shiism, Khotamiyat, Shafo'ad, and Mahdaviyat. And then he went, he went on to articulate a new and modern Islam that was open to modern sciences, it was tolerant of religious minorities, and open towards women's greater presence in the public sphere. But his argument was explosive. Several times, the offices of the Surah Israfil were ransacked, and so Surah Israfil changed course. Instead of pushing for religious reform and ways of bridging the gap between human law and divine law, it moved to propagating social democratic reforms, civil liberties, ratification of Article 8, which gave equal rights to Iranian men regardless of their religion rights of peasants in an eight-hour day, essentially securing reforms through the re legislative and grassroots means and leaving the project of religious reform for future generations. During the 1908 coup, we should remember the man managing editor of the paper, Mirza Jawan Girkhan Shirazi, was one of the first men to be executed by the state, and the Khuda barely escaped alive. None of what I just said takes away from this magnificent work by Professor Amonat. I want to congratulate him for this remarkable achievement, a work that will be read by generations to come and will be required reading for any serious student of modern Iranian history. Thank you. Mm -hmm.